Hello and welcome to the first of a series of videos looking at the saxophone playing of the great American jazz musician Wessel Warm Daddy Anderson. My name is Joshua Jaswan. I'm a jazz saxophone player from London, currently enjoying things here in Copenhagen. And each of these videos is going to look at a different solo by Wes and explore some of the reasons why, for me at least, he's one of the leading alto players of his generation. Wessel Anderson was born in 1966 and grew up in Brooklyn, New York. He was a central musical voice of Winter Marcellus's septet, a group that worked prolifically from around 1988 to 1994, and he was also a mainstay of the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra from the early 1990s to 2006. His distinct alto saxophone sound and innovative musical conception can be heard on seminal albums such as Blood on the Fields, City Movement, and The Majesty of the Blues. And this video is going to look at a Wessel Anderson solo from 1994. The solo is on a composition of Winton's entitled Buggy Ride, and it's from a live album called Live at the Village Vanguard by the Winton Marcellus Septet. The solo is on a short, repeating, 16-bar form. The tempo is pretty bright, around 300 BPM, and Wes takes a 13 chorus solo, accompanied by a rhythm section of Ben Wolf on double bass, Eric Reed on piano, and Hurling Riley on drums.
So, a note by note analysis of the solo is not really possible here, but instead we're going to look at three or four moments that reflect distinctive elements of Weddell's style and musical identity and demonstrate expressive and communicative qualities of his playing. One of the big themes that I've taken from this solo is the way in which Wes has amalgamated the approaches to improvising used by Louis Armstrong, Roy Eldridge and swing era saxophone players such as Benny Carter, Johnny Hodges and Willie Smith with his own razor sharp, clinical and crystal clear linear melodic conception derived from the music of Charlie Parker. It's this fusion, the bringing together of these musical worlds, that gives Wessel's musical personality so much of its distinctiveness and individuality. If we listen again a bit slower to the third chorus of the solo, the opening phrase of Wessel's is something that Benny Carter, Roy Eldridge and Johnny Hodges all could have played. There you go. However, he then immediately contrasts this with a Parker-derived line that twists with chromatic enclosures and altered chord tones resolving onto the low G on the outer. But what really defines what is his sound here is the way that he ends the phrase. Instead of using conventional bebop syntax to end the musical sentence, for example, he instead soars into an ascending melodic line that has the drama and excitement that you'd find in a Louis Armstrong solo cadenza. Using and combining the grandeur and expressiveness of Louis Armstrong's phrasing with a highly refined bebop melodic conception gives Wessel's playing so much warmth, spontaneity and feeling of surprise. Moving on to chorus 5, this passage demonstrates how Wessel Anderson is a master of using the whole range of the instrument and the different timbres he gets from the different ranges of the instrument to dramatically shape the ending of a phrase. Here, he goes from the top F sharp on the alto all the way down to the low B and then onto the low B flat, the lowest note on the horn, with a sweeping operatic grandeur that one would usually associate with earlier styles of saxophone players such as Coleman Hawkins. Chorus 7 deals with the way in which Wessel Anderson combines the rhythmic elasticity of Louis Armstrong with his own highly refined melodic concept. The first phrase Wes plays is similar in feel to what we hear in Armstrong's 1933 recording of Dinah Lee, where both musicians seem to float their note placements above a searing up-tempo pulse while still creating a feeling of rhythmic drive and forward motion. However, in the second phrase or second half of the chorus, Wes cuts through the changes, unraveling a serpentine melodic phrase that eventually resolves itself onto the tonic chord of D major or concert F major. <laughs> Then, when we hear both phrases in context, Wessel's distinct harmonic approach to expanding, varying and substituting chords within a harmonic sequence will be more fully looked at during later videos in the series, but the 8th chorus nevertheless gives the listener a little glimpse into the ways in which Warm Daddy can stretch out the harmonic landscape of a piece. <laughs> Here, he 
takes the chromatically shifting idea that he plays in the first four bars of the chorus. <laughs> and then develops this motif in the following four bars. With both phrases played together. During Wes's playing on the compositions Pedro's Getaway and Down Home with Homie, which are from the same album as this solo, his harmonic conception is more fully expanded upon, and both of those solos will feature later in the series. The last chorus of the solo, Chorus 13, is a crystallised 16-bar gem of Wes's bluesful and soulful melodic conception. There's aspects of Armstrong's melodic vocabulary here, aspects of Parker's melodic vocabulary, chromatic shifts and turns, and all played with a drama and playfulness that are cornerstones of Wes's sound and style. enjoy checking out this introduction to Wessel Anderson's playing. The link to the original recording can be found in the video description and his solo starts at around 3 minutes 20. For me, Wessel Anderson is one of the leading alto saxophone players of his generation. However, in comparison to his peers and saxophone players of a similar age, such as Vincent Herring, Antonio Hart and Jesse Davis, Wessel's playing and musical conception is considerably less than known. So, if you like what you've heard, please spread the word and check out the next video in the series, which will be coming out very, very soon. Thanks a lot.